Welcome to Old Path Ministries and our Talking Points series. On this particular topic, we're going to take a look at the modern church and what it looks like relative to, say, Acts chapter 2. Now, this is a topic that I've been asked to address in documentaries, and uh, I've done it at, at, uh, at church a number of times because we take a look at the way that church cultures kind of change over the years and really... I guess you could say the what some people would call the mega churches have become something that's been kind of in the the discussion really since the 80s of the churches that have the thousands of people that will come to them and uh, it it really is quite an industry especially as far as the United States is concerned but that's kind of what I want to examine with you uh, in this in this particular topic and uh, to compare it to what we would see back in say Acts chapter 2 and take a look at the uh, the churches and, and the models, if you will. And that's probably the best way that we can step off into this. Because oftentimes we'll hear about church growth models. And really it's, uh, you, you see successful churches. People will ask them what is the, the you know secret of your success. And they'll usually have some kind of a methodology behind them. And so um, the church growth movement was something that really began to to. Uh, tick up in the 2000s and, and even in the 90s and really people that we became uh, became really familiar with their names people like Rick Warren and uh, and Bill Hybels were kind of the, the people that really became most recognizable in the modern context of this and so uh, if when you hear Bill Hybels think Willow Creek and many of the churches are very, very similar what you see in, in what you're going to get when you walk in the door. It's kind of what I want to examine in light of what we see in Acts chapter 2. And uh, really, the, the important part of this before I start to address it and take a look at what it was like in the early church and examine how the models are today, I want to make sure that I point this out, that this isn't uh, really not a, a, any kind of a, a commentary on any particular church or even maybe one that you attend and think that somehow this is a, some kind of an attack. It's just to ask some basic questions about the church that we see in the 21st century, especially in the West and really in the United States, and comparing it to what it would have been like, say, in the first century, what a church would have been like. And uh, when we really begin to examine it that way, it becomes kind of an interesting comparison between the two. And then the next step would be if we compare the church in the West and in the United States to the churches that um, are, are having to try to meet the needs of their people in parts of the world where it's not only dangerous, but some places it could actually even be deadly to you if you would identify as a Christian and assemble together as believers. Um, there are people that are in those countries that would be looking to kill that kind of a, a group of people. That is much more reflective of what we saw in the first century. So with that being said, let's um, kind of address the topic a little bit and really what I think the, the early church was kind of best known for. Now, in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 2, probably the best place for us to take a look at and to start this whole discussion, we see in Acts chapter 2 the events that happen there. In, in fact, it's kind of great to take it by every chapter as it goes. So if I was to look at, say, the first eight chapters, um, it's a great way of us understanding how the church itself was kind of established. So what we have in chapter 1 is the the group of apostles they've been told by jesus to go and to wait in jerusalem until the promise of the father now that would be the sending of the holy spirit and the dynamic work that would happen through the church in uh in in signs and wonders that took place and that was what we see happen by acts chapter 2. now this is distinctly different from them being born again because the, the events that happened in chapter 2 is not a being born again kind of work of the Holy Spirit. That was done back in John chapter 20 with them. So um, it's more important that we recognize when Jesus breathed life into them in chapter 20. That was when they were regenerated. That's when they were born again, when Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit. So what we see in Acts chapter 2 is the outward way that the Holy Spirit would do all of the miraculous things. And it started at Pentecost. So long after Jesus' resurrection, salvation and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit had already begun and people were born again by the time that we see that the matters of Acts chapter 2. 
So what ends up happening, this, this experience, this incredible work of the Holy Spirit in chapter 2, presents Peter with an opportunity to exercise evangelism in a way that hadn't ever been done before. And so in Acts chapter 2, that's what we see take place. Chapters 3 and chapter 4 and even into chapter 5, we start to see that this very young group of believers, young in the sense of them being the church, start to experience persecution as they are doing ministry outside the doors of the church. And so when they're out in the temple and they're ministering to people, a lot of people are coming to faith. Miracles are beginning to happen. We have them recorded for us there in Acts uh, chapter uh, 3 and 4 and uh, even Acts chapter 2. There's the miracles that take place. And it begins to get the attention of some of the powers that be. By chapter 6, they're starting to have even some internal uh, troubles that you see that's brought to the, the, uh, the church heads, the, the apostles. And basically, it's a, about just the function of a church. And what do we do about the needs of the people within the church? And there's disputes going on. The, um, what, what you find is that the apostles kind of start the beginning of other people to, to deal with the ministry to the people, the deacons and the elders, and that kind of stuff is starting to happen. And people's needs are being met. But by chapter 7, you have the very first um, uh, martyr of the church in Stephen. He's put to death for his faith. And by chapter 8, the church in Jerusalem is scattered outside of the, the city of Jerusalem. And as we read in chapter 8, only the, the apostles were left. So persecution comes. So because of that persecution, the church is, is kind of, we, we would kind of think of it as a bit more underground, though they didn't seem to come after the apostles right away. And so they were still able, they were still able to somewhat function, but the, the normal day-to-day -day person was really kind of put in a place where they felt they needed to get out of Jerusalem. Now, there was no mega church at the time. There was no corporate building that was off-site where they would go and they would do it like we have here in the West. What they would meet is house to house as we see. And look at back at, at looking back at chapter 2, that's what we want to look at first. And this comes right on the heels of the people coming to um, a saving knowledge and a belief in the person of Jesus Christ at the preaching of, of Peter. So let's remember everything that's going on here, whether it's the apostles and whether it's the people that are speaking, the evangelism that's taking place, none of this is in a church. This is all outdoors and it, it's drawn the attention because of what took place in the, in the upper room, but it's drawn people from the outside, and so Peter is able to deal with them. This is in the old city, and he evangelizes them, and many come to faith. Now look what we see in verse 40. It says, in many, With many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. There's the evangelism after all the other things that he said. Now, those who received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So everything that happened outside... Um, or of the evangelism and all those things that took place happened outside the doors of where they would meet in common. These, these places, really kind of dwellings where they would meet. But when you have thousands, that means that people were meeting in their homes all over the place. There was no big corporate place of worship. In fact, a large corporate place of worship, if you think, take any of the big mega churches that you want to think about, and if you were to just be able to transplant that building and put it on the, say, the Mount of Olives, at this time, it wouldn't have survived a week out of the persecution, the fact that people wouldn't understand what was going on. And oftentimes the focus of the mega churches nowadays is very different from the focus of the early church. Take a look here at what we see. In verse 42, it says, And so they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayer. So there are the four things that are mentioned here. It would seem from everything that, that I see and having been around churches for a long time, there, there is much of the church that has the, the, these things completely in the wrong order. Because if, first of all, it's the doctrine of the apostles, let's make sure we understand what that means. A doctrine, or to say doctrine in this context, just means those things that are taught. And so if it's the apostles' doctrine, well, where did they learn what they were teaching? They learned it directly from Jesus, and he had told them to be witnesses of what he had taught them. Okay, great. 
So what they would say is the things that we have learned from Jesus, we are now making those things known to you. So they they continued with a steadfastness. It means that they had made this their, this was their goal. This was their aim. This is what they would do. They were going to continue in those teachings from the apostles, which came directly from Jesus. Now, later on, when it's Paul the apostle, he's not among them at this time. Rather, he's instructed after the fact by Jesus directly, and he's the one who gives us a lot of the teaching of doctrine that we understand by the epistles that are there, because he takes that to the Gentile world, and he's teaching them. But those churches like this one, or like these ones here, were much different than what we see in the modern 21st century. So we read on with this, and it says these other things. They, they continued in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, that, that common bond of brother and sister, the Philadelphia, the koinonia fellowship, the koinonia be in the Greek. It's the idea of, of we have these things in common. And so they gathered together. And then, of course, you'll notice then in the breaking of bread and in prayer. So if you look at any of those things, whether it's the prayer, if you don't even understand doctrinally who God is and how you address him and what things you would ask and by what authority, you have no context for prayer. Breaking of bread, if it's a, a meal of just being among brothers and sisters, or if we're even talking about a commemoration of the of the upper room and the Passover kind of a meal, if they continue doing it in that theme, or what we would call communion. However it is, as they gather together for communal types of meals, once again, if you don't understand why they're doing this from the Apostles' Doctrine, there's no context to that, nor is there fellowship. What things do you have in common, if not for the common beliefs that you would have as disciples of Jesus Christ? Okay, so it's pretty simple. Oftentimes, the churches that we see, especially in the 21st century, are not so much concerned about doctrine, the teaching of the scripture, but the focus seems to be much more on the fellowship and on the breaking of bread, getting together in you know, small communities and home fellowships after church and all that kind of stuff. None of it is wrong. The question is, what happens at church and what is the level of, of doctrinal instruction that we learn what it is that makes us have these things in common? If those things are not discussed in church, then they lose a lot of context of why we get together and, you know, the all the other other things that are going on here. So all of those things need to work totally compatible with one another. If there's prayer, if there's breaking of bread, if there's fellowship, it's all done based upon common belief and common knowledge based upon the doctrine or the things that were taught from Jesus to the disciples or to the apostles rather and the apostles to the rest of the disciples and then down through the generations through the word of God. That's supposed to be the order of things. Now, if we take a look at the modern church culture, oftentimes you will find churches that are heavily emphasizing the idea that people can come to their church and so that's where we get the whole label of the unchurched. So the unchurched would be the people that are now the focus. We've got to get those people in the door. And they do so because this is a way of bringing new members into a church or new, new people that call that church home. So the messages tend to be very shallow and very, quote, evangelical, easy to understand if they're even, you know, doctrinally accurate. But they're, they're a lot of times going to be entirely entertaining with a lot of other things that are pretty dazzling to the senses. Maybe there are videos or, or they might have skits. You've seen these kind of things probably on, on YouTube and whatnot. And the theatrics that are now happening in the church are a complete substitute for the apostles' doctrine. Their defense that they would give is, well, this is what it takes to bring the unchurched in so that we can reach them. But they never get around to that, prop, that, that, that bottom line thing of doctrine. So here's the, the bigger problem that you have with that. If every church service is focused on the lights and the music, the skits, the videos, the sensory things that are meant to appeal to the unbeliever that is in your midst, what about the people who are the believers? Now they're being fed a steady diet of shallow, non-substantive, non-doctrinal, nothing of any great value eternally speaking, nothing that really gives them, the believer, a reason to believe deeper and more more thoroughly. Rather, they are entertained. 
Right along with that is why we have so much entertainment that's happening through the quote worship. And it's it's really been something that I've I've seen a lot in the last 10 to 15 years especially and it's been going on longer than that. But these big production kinds of music ministry that's going on, the interesting thing about it is if you're just able to print out most worship music and just put it on a piece of paper with no music or you just read it for its content, you find that it is so horribly lacking. Oftentimes you can't even tell who is the object of worship in that stuff. It, it's wrapped in all kinds of little Christian buzzwords and whatnot. But is God genuinely being worshipped in that, or are people really more being driven by the, the the production aspect of it, and how good, and how what's the quality of it, and is it catchy, and do we like the, the, the melody to it? But they never really examine it for the content. It's one of the ways that you found a lot of bad doctrine has made its way into the church because it's really catchy. In fact, I would even go further and say bad theology has made its way into the church and there's a difference between doctrine and theology. Theology is about really the study of the nature of God and how does he do what he do, what he does rather. And then doctrine would be based upon what we know of God and how he does what he does. How are we supposed to walk according to our understanding of what's in scripture and what does scripture teach us to do? So with all that being said, the one thing that this really doesn't ever even begin to address of all of those kinds of churches that we see in our in our world today and especially in the West, you would want to say, because of the incredible freedoms that we have been given in this country, and I am thankful to God for it. Again, you, you all know, I'm sure by this time you know, I've been pastoring for a whole lot of years. You know, we've been a part of the church we had just left when we moved to Texas. We had been there for 34 years. I was the senior pastor there for almost 10, and I'd been involved in ministry for a very long time. Did we have nice lights? Yeah. Was the stage nice? We had a beautiful sanctuary, this gorgeous, from the 30s place. It was a gift from God to that ministry, and we're so thankful for it. So I don't have any problems with technology. I'm glad that we have microphones, and I'm glad that we have amplification, and I'm glad that we have lights, and that we have live stream and all the technology. That's fantastic. But what we ultimately are supposed to be doing is ministering to the flock of God and instructing them in God's word no matter where he puts us. I don't care if it was a tiny little place in a little strip mall where nobody knows where you are, or if it was this really beautiful building like we had in Cyprus. When we were there, it's still operational to this day, and thank God for the people who, who've carried on the ministry there. But the bottom line to it is that we never wanted to make it about the entertainment aspect of it because people will be entertained, but they'll never grow in their understanding of who God is. So it is for every person who might consider this, who maybe goes to a church or is considered going to a church, or maybe you're having to move and you're looking for a different church, or however the case may be, take a look at what goes on in the place. Who is being ministered to in that place? Is it really a place where the church comes together and they minister one to another, and the Word of God is the ultimate focus of that so that the church may grow in their understanding of who Jesus is and what he has done for them, about how the, the depths of God's love has motivated him to send his son to die in our place. Those are very, very important messages. Now, what you find oftentimes, along with those churches that don't really seem to spend as much time doctrinally, you're also going to find that their approach to the Bible is much different. It's not a systematic teaching through the scripture. It's usually going to be using a verse here and a verse there as a platform to speak more in the motivational sense, maybe philosophically, have a lot of little anecdotal stories about things of culture and relevant types of things that we all understand. And it's, it's meant to relate to people on a basic, almost even on an earthly level. Okay, well, people may like that. The problem is it lacks substance and it doesn't make for strong disciples because it's based upon methodology and model. It's not based upon the word of God of making disciples. So everybody should just be able to look at that and determine for themselves, whatever church it is that they may see or have questions about, what is the, what, what is the quality of the teaching of the word of God? One of the red flags that you'll see is if there is any particular part of the Bible that seems to be off limits to them, whether it is 
topically or an entire book. I know a lot of churches will really uh, almost avoid the entirety of the Old Testament, except for maybe Psalms and possibly Proverbs, or they will avoid books like the book of Revelation or particular chapters that may argue against their particular doctrinal view. The word faith people and the prosperity gospel people. Uh, I can show you chapters that they will never even begin to look at because it refutes that whole belief system. But again, if, if all of the messages are either tailored to a particular view of something and there's really an end result, it's something that they want to get out of the people, or if every message is tailored towards those who don't believe or who are marginal, then again, where is the place for the mature? Where is that? So along those lines, in the book of Ephesians, there's a very interesting thing, once again, that is given to us, and Paul writes this. And again, think about how this would sound to a church like Philippi, or like Ephesus, or Colossae, or Corinth, or any of those churches there in either Greece or in Turkey, where most of his ministry took place. These are churches that are very much coming out of a pagan culture. So you're not going to get the mega church, 4,000 people strong, kind of, you know, almost community center kind of a feel where they have all kinds of programs and children's ministry. And again, none of that stuff is evil on its own. None of that stuff is wrong on its own. Everything is going to be predicated upon this. Is the word of God the primary reason why the assembly gathers? And once inside the doors, is the worship being addressed to the God who saves? And then is the message, is it a systematic working through the text so that people understand the whole counsel of God, as Paul would tell us in Acts chapter 20. He was always faithful to teach all aspects of what's in the scripture and not just what is popular. So with that being said, we, we get this from, from uh, Ephesians chapter 4, and Paul is writing here to the church at Ephesus, and he's talking about the order of things. And how it began with the person of Jesus and the birth that there was of the church. And then when Jesus left this earth, what he had done was, was make sure that the church was able to continue on based upon the things that he had taught. And so with that, it tells us in verse 11, and that God himself gave some men, some people to be apostles, some to be prophets and some evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. So with all of those different groups of people, it's pretty easy to track down who they are and we can see where they were used, especially let's remember the, this is a New Testament church and it is a church in a pagan part of the world. These are not Jews that he's talking to per se, though Jews would have been among them. This is Ephesus, okay? So this is modern day west coast of Turkey where he's having this discussion with them. So to the church, there would be those ones, the prophets, those ones that God would have and he would equip them to speak of things that are happening or, you know, in sometimes in place of warning or of saying, here's what God is going to do. Then the apostles would be those ones that are sent forth. These are more titles of what the person operating in that way would do. So then there are some that were evangelists. And that's, again, where we saw Peter doing what he did in chapter two. So God has given people who are gifted in these areas. And then the last that he mentions are the pastors and teachers. But he says this. And it says that this is for the equipping, verse 12, of the saints for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. So, oddly enough, when you see the work of evangelism, apostles, and prophets, though some of that stuff may have happened in the church, especially with the prophets and the apostles, the evangelism and everything in the early church that we saw was done outdoors. Because in the doors of the church was where the faithful gathered together to learn the apostles' doctrine and to grow in their understanding of God. So it wasn't shallow. In fact, this was where the meat of it came from. And it was the, the thing that really locked them in to their growth in the person of Jesus Christ. So that when trouble would come, they would have a great foundation to them. And it is why Paul emphasized over and over and over again, doctrine to the churches, but in particular, when you look at what he said to Titus and to Timothy, doctrine was such an important matter to him, not only that he taught it, but that they would teach it as well. <clears throat> so it was a it was a very big emphasis as far as he was concerned. So when we look at these things, just to kind of wrap all of this up, it's important for us whenever we hear about this model and that model and this kind of church and that kind of church, 
how many people come and go out of the doors is of no consequence, no importance whatsoever. I've had people say, well, look at, we can tell that God blesses that particular ministry because look at how many thousands of people go there. Well, that doesn't mean anything because that just simply means that people are drawn to that particular church for whatever reason, most of it, most of those times when those are the churches that, that don't spend much time in the Word, but they got a lot of people, well, they're entertaining, or they're this or they're that, or they're welcoming, or they're very family-oriented, or whatever else. But numbers do not mean success, not by a long shot. Now, if there's a church with thousands of people, and they are dedicated to teach their people from Genesis to Revelation and go through every chapter and every verse, that's a healthy church. It's going to be healthy. And the one thing that we should really make sure we recognize, the uh, the world in which we live right now, chapter, or chapter <laughs> but um, the year 2020, if COVID has taught us anything in this, look at some of the states where the church came face to face with governments who were really intent on shutting them down. And then we get a little bit of, a, of an understanding of what it's like for some churches to have to function in the rest of the world. I'll say it this way. The big church movement and the big church models what we would some kind, uh, they will call it themselves, the seeker-sensitive churches. It means that they want to have a sensitivity to those people who may have some questions but are not dedicated believers. And they build the entire church towards that group and not towards the church faithful themselves. Okay, great. That's going to make a very shallow church, and you'll know it by what happens over the pulpit. If there's no emphasis on the Word of God, or if it's just a verse here and a verse there, and then a lot of eloquence about this, that, but there's no instruction in the Word, that is a dangerous, dangerous place to be. And, again, as COVID has shown us, if it ever comes to be a very inconvenient or a difficult thing to be a believer— the people who are used to that kind of a model will not know what to do when trouble comes. The first church did. The first church, first church, it was their lives every single day. And so they had these things in common. They were not easily shaken in this, even if it cost them their lives. We have this incredible comfort in this country of being able to say we have freedom to express how it is that we believe we are free to do what we want to do but let's not kid ourselves into thinking that we can take any of the big mega churches in our in our world today and even plant them somewhere else in our world they couldn't function somewhere else they really are a construct of the west so take whatever church you want to look at any of the big big name tv preachers and take their whole ministry and stick it in afghanistan Put it in Sudan or Saudi Arabia. Put it in any of those places. Put it in Ethiopia. Put it in Egypt. Put it in those places and see how long it would last. Would it be able to function even more than a few days before it was either destroyed or that no one would show up for fear of their lives? And then just remember this, that the church itself should be able to function anywhere in the world, no matter where it's put. And the people within that church would still be able to come together and they would have a common bond and a common belief, though they understand the risks. There's no cost to being a believer in this world of the United States and of the West as it is currently configured. But the question would be, someday that's got to come to an end. And what would happen to the church if it really became something that it may cost you dearly to be a part of it? How quickly would those churches fold? The answer is pretty obvious. And it is all based upon one very simple truth. A church should only be considered a church if it really follows the model that we have in the scripture. And if it's able to bring thousands into it, then thank God for it. Because nothing would make me happier than to see every church of thousands take their people systematically through the word of God, that they would be the best instructed church anywhere that you'll find, because from the, from the pulpit and the pastor... To the people who are sitting in the seats, they recognize the thing that makes and energizes the church is the work of the Holy Spirit, and he grows us in our understanding based upon the, the Word of God. Paul tells us in Romans 10 that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Not just a little bit here, a bit there, and a verse here, and a verse there to, to build some kind of uh, a belief that will make you kind of come to some conclusion. We're talking about 
reading the entire and understanding the entirety of the scripture. And in doing so, there are times that you will find that the scripture makes you very uncomfortable, which is a good thing because that means that God has work that he wants to do in your life. And he's also promised that the Holy Spirit would lead you through those times as you grow. So that's an important thing that we should understand. So again, none of this is personal. Look, if people want to go to church uh, because it's really cool and it's got great lights and music and really soft on the message and there's really not a lot of content to it, that's fine. But do that eyes wide open. But don't try to pretend that it's a church in the first century kind of a model. That's a construct of our modern times. But we want to look at the scriptures and say, what was it like in those times? And if God has given us the freedom to meet where we can do so and meet in very large gatherings, my hope is that the church would understand where it came from and that it would be faithful to the word of God, again, from the pastor to the person in the pulpit or to the person in the pews, rather, that they would be genuinely of one mind in this and they would dedicate themselves to growing through the, the word of God and by that work of the Holy Spirit. If you have questions on this, I know that it's a controversial topic. People like to take it personal because, well, maybe he's talking about our church. Don't even care about that or don't even worry about those kind of things. You're the only one who knows. When you sit down in your church, has your pastor been careful to study the Word of God and then, then make sure that it is taught accurately without his opinion or anyone else's? What is the Scripture saying how is it is it to be applied to our own lives and is it being taught accurately that's all that matters and you're the only ones who can tell that again so i don't have to make it personal it is just an observation from the text and we should be faithful to his word so again any questions on that please you have the email it's at the end of this you can go ahead and email me your questions i'd love to be able to converse these with, uh, things with you and uh, answer any questions that you may have god bless you 